focus is a little bit of what we do, what we want to do, and what we're still doing. And uh, how we got there, I, did, uh, I think it's interesting. This is Brazil, uh, it's a Google Maps view, and uh, the dot on the right is Rio de Janeiro. And uh, in 1941, Brazil managed to negotiate with the US an integrated uh, steel mill. Before that, we only had uh, charcoal mules and uh, non-integrated mules. And then we had a big discussion during 1941 with the US and the US wanted to use some uh, air bases right in the Northeast here. Uh, and so they gave us, or they sold us, I don't know. But in 1941, they thought they wanted to give us a, a, a big steel mule. And uh, it was a big fight because Rio, Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte are all important cities. And so they decided to put it in the middle, and that's uh, where Volta Redonda is. It was a city that was created to, to host this integrated steel mill. And then this is the steel mill. I mean, it was founded in, in 1941. Uh, today it has a 6 million ton steel per year capacity. Some people don't like these uh, brownish pictures, but I think they are very nice. Uh, Bossi has been there with me in the melt shop right here in front. This is the melt shop. And uh, there's a nice hotel that you can see the power plant, the the, the melt, the, the whole plant, and it's called Bella Vista, which is, means beautiful view. So it's a it's a city of steel, and we are here. This is uh, the location of our school. So you can imagine that the school uh, is fully dedicated to steel and to understanding and helping. And initially, the school was created to interact with the steel industries in the region and the, our main focus in the very beginning in the 60s was and i was not there yet but it was on forming the first generations of metallurgical engineers for brazil because this was a, a i mean it was not an organized science yet in brazil it's not like england france italy where you have these things running for or sweden i, I forgot that I mean, sweden was right from the beginning there so we had to learn this and spread the knowledge and and then later we focus into research and graduate program, which we have now. And I'll give you just two examples. Uh, Paulo Rangel Rios, which I guess some of you know. I'm sure Harry, Sir Harry knows uh, Professor Hughes, who works in grain growth and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not the second most important, I'm just the one that uh, doing the talk. So I'll, I'll just talk about my work and how I got there. And uh, a little bit, uh, since Fabio mentioned the books, I mean, uh, life is full of uh, lucky episodes. So in 1976, I graduated and I said I want to work in steel making. And then I was uh, I was able to work in this company right on the left of the slide, where you see it's called Eletrometal. It was the biggest or the best steel maker in Brazil. They had electroslide furnaces. And I started working in the melt shop, which was crazy because at that time I was a physical metallurgist. And so then uh, we had a real good partnership. Uh, we had, we made these books, and uh, and I was part time teaching at university and part time in industry. And uh, this was such already the edition when uh, Berle has bought Eletrometal. So now it is a Berle plant in Brazil. And uh, I was so lucky that in 1997 I got uh, you can see three people here who, which were key to our success. This is. Uh, with us today is Professor Bosumban. He was kind enough in 1997 to come to Brazil. This is a, the, it's not a, a court, a basketball court. This is our school, and this is Professor Bosumban. This is Susana Fries, who is currently in Bochum, which is our great friend too. And this is the deceased the Ibrahim Antara, Imo Antara, who was. So th I had the, the opportunity in 1997 to bring the three key persons. I think only Leo Lucas did not come because he was not, I mean, he would rather travel by train, but, uh, and trains to Brazil are not very frequent. But anyway, I got these three geniuses and three fantastic people who gave the opportunity. I'm this guy here, you might not recognize, but I'm this young, uh, dark hair guy here. And we made the first workshop on computational thermodynamics in Brazil, and it became a real success. And then we had the round robin seminars with um, a lot of, uh, important and famous people. This is Ted Masowski, for those uh, who know him, the, the guy from the handbooks. This is Toru Matsumiya. This is Oki Johnson from Thermocult. This is Bob Dehoff. So it was 
we had all this, this is that Sumori, so we had all these opportunities. And then we had 2011, we had the CalFed in Rio. So we've been really, really deep into trying to use uh, computational thermodynamics in steel. So we had such a lot of co collaboration with steel makers and other researchers at universities, at research institutes, and we know, and we focus on as you might know, or non-metallic inclusion. So we have been working very much on wire for springs, tire cords, uh, bearing steels, uh, valve clogging and process designs. These are uh, eternal problems in steel making. Then we have done a, an interesting work because computational thermodynamics allows you to do all these crazy things. I mean, to study real slags and how they react with the refractory. So we develop slag coating for converters, slag splashing processes. Uh, we are now working on the slag recycling because uh, there's so much slag being generated that uh, it's a big environmental problem. And then uh, we also doing very, or very recently, some interesting process modeling using computational thermodynamics. Then we also worked in alloy and process design, trying to make better Microloy steels mostly. I mean, I think microloy has a fantastic opportunity because it's uh, we are you are conserving elements that are not that uh, easy to find in the world. Instead of putting 10% or 5% of something, you're putting less than 1%. And it, uh, but it's, uh, it does a lot of uh, interesting things to do with, with the dissolution, precipitation, segregation. There's a lot, a lot of interesting process control that computational thermodynamics can help you do. And then also in long products, which is a, a very low end of the alimentary or the feeding chain of steels, which is just rebar. But rebar is used in immense quantities and it's a very important product because it has to be very cheap and very ecological because you're making a lot of it. So we are working on this quite a lot too. And now looking at greener steel, I always show this because we have to we live in the southern hemisphere. It's just quite different from you. So if I fly from my airport here in Rio and I want to go to Amsterdam, which is a nice connection for going to Europe, uh, this generates almost 1.5 tons of CO2. I generate, I mean, I, I am responsible personally for this. So this gives you a, a rough idea of how efficient we are. I mean, I, I, if instead of going to Calfat or going to visit uh, Fabio, I decided to make steel, I could almost make one ton of steel. So my the environmental impact of making one ton of steel is really, really, really low. I mean, you can say, wow, it's huge. Of course, if you now multiply this by 2,000 million tons of steel per year, then any number becomes giant. Of course, this means we have to take care of it because the total is what matters. But you must be careful because if you say, well, let's replace steel, this is not a good idea because um, most materials that you have available to replace steel are going to, hear, to have much worse environmental impacts. Now, the, the fun thing about steel, and this gives you a fantastic opportunity, if you look at the process uh, evolution versus PO2 or the oxygen potential, you get what I call the, the steel making roller coaster. We start with ore, and then we sort of go very, very low in the oxygen potential. And this is because not only because we need it, but uh, it's because we need to saturate the pig iron in carbon so that it becomes liquid and, it, and we can take it out of the blast furnace. So there's two, two really important things to consider when you are going to reduce carbon usage in steel making. One is, okay, carbon is a fuel, you can take it out. Carbon, carbon is a reducing agent, okay, you can take it out. But in the blast furnace, you, you always will need 4% carbon to saturate the pig iron so it becomes liquid. You cannot get higher temperatures, so this is taken. And then you go to the steel making and then you oxidize to remove this. And then you say, well, I cannot cast this if this is oxidized, so you deoxidize again. So this is funny and crazy, and um, you can put numbers on it, of course. But of co what happens here is that there's two main routes to fight this. One is smelting. Smelting means, uh, and this has been around for like 40, 50 years, Professor Fruhan, there's been many initiatives of trying to come from this point directly to this point without doing this roller coaster. And this is coming on and on again. And the other one is just change uh, the reducing agents and, and reduce somehow the 
our footprint. Now the trends, unfortunately or fortunately, I mean, for me it's fortunately because we are using more and more steel. I mean, China, of course, makes 50% of the steel in the world, but uh, it's not going to decrease it because it's a cheap material, it's an efficient material, it's a 100% recyclable material. It has a, a footprint of carbon, but it's not the worst. And uh, we have been doing a lot of improvement in energy efficiency. I mean, if you look at the, when uh, England started because they were sitting on 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 peat and, and coal just like crazy. So they started just making pig iron uh, using huge amounts of energy. But we came very, this is the figure from Ashby. Uh, we came very, very, very close to home, to the minimum energy that we can use. And then when you look at it, you see iron making the blast furnace currently is, is the, the, the bad guy. So we have to remove at least the portion that is fuel, uh, use something that is not carbon. That, that's uh, very nice. But uh, the question is where is it going? I mean, the, everybody's talking about hydrogen. We're going to talk a little bit uh, in, in a second about it. But uh, and this is what we did uh, to our world. So I mean, if you can say, I'm going to talk a little bit about charcoal uh, in, in a second, and Brazil is strong in charcoal. We have uh, charcoal blast furnaces and so on. But if you look since the industrial revolution around here, I mean, we have just uh, increased the health and, and the lifetime of the population. Population grew, and we have to feed people. So this is, if you look at grazing and crops, this is taking a whole of work. So it's really not a good idea to take more land to make charcoal, for instance, although it's very nice and very ecological, uh, at least you should do just, I mean, just farm uh, paper, uh, wood for paper because we don't have anything better for paper, but uh, for steel making, there's no sense in going into this green area here to make more crops of trees because uh, it's, it's not really sensible. But anyway, currently what we're doing is we're trying to do like Japan. I mean, we're trying to improve electric arc furnace charge because this is a much better, lower carbon footprint. Of course, you have the big problem of where the electricity is going to come from. Uh, we are improving laid operations. We are working on low density steels. I mean, if you, it's amazing what POSCO has shown uh, and Professor uh, Sir Harry, Professor Badesha has been a professor. He's, I think he still is a professor at POSCO and POSTEC has developed some wonderful steels with like six point something density, which it's uh, unbelievable. I mean, the energy savings that you make on cars and buses and stuff, you can, if you just lower the density of steel. Of course, you have a problem with aluminum and manganese, which is going to be interesting. And then going to smarter high strength steels, because this is going also going to be more efficient in other uh, energy ch uh, chains in, uh, in the world. Then, uh, so if you look at the two sides, I mean, we have one side that is evolution, and this means more electric arc furnace, more is like recirculating, improving your life of refractories, more use of direct reduction. Uh, in our case, we can use a little bit of charcoal, but uh, that's, as I mentioned, there's a limit. You can do lignin, which is very nice if you hydrolyze wood. You can take the cellulose for paper, in, and the lignin is left for coal, but it, it's more expensive. And uh, in the product size, you can go to lower density, stronger steel, and use more and more thermomechanical heat tr treatment instead of going through thermo heat or mechanical treatment and then heat treatment. Now, if you go to the real revolution, then you have the new reducing agents and fuels like hydrogen. And again, uh, and also electrolysis of iron oxide, which uh, Boston Metals and MIT are very strong. But uh, keep in mind that to do this, you have to generate electricity. So now in Europe, you have uh, decided that uh, both the nuclear and the natural gas are sustainable. Uh, OK, I'm not going to debate that, but uh, uh, you're not going to generate all the hydrogen you need with the wind farms. I mean, you need the, like for a two mega, two million ton per year steel plants, you need 900 megawatts just to generate hydrogen. And um, this is going to be like uh, one nuclear power plant, one, one classical Pramatom uh, previous generation uh, nuclear power plant. So this is not like you're going for CSM, for instance, you would need 
three fermaton plants to fuel to give all the hydrogen you need, or you need the uh, I don't know maybe nine huge or uh, uh, wind plants like they have in Hamburg. <clears throat> so this is a problem. Same with electrolysis. I mean. Uh, the people at MIT are, are looking at very efficient electrolysis, not as bad as aluminum, but it, it still is going to consume a huge amount of electricity. And there's no, I mean, if you're using coal to generate electricity, what is the point? I mean, it's going to be, or if even if you're using natural gas, I mean, there's still a lot of carbon in the natural gas. It's a great solution, but uh, it's not still a, a clean solution. And finally, I mean, the smelting, direct smelting, smelting we have a I have a colleague here who has a nice patent for removing phosphorus from the iron ore before going into the blast furnace, and this is going to be a big change. Also, if you, if you can can remove sulfur from coal, coal can, can become less and less relevant. And uh, then there's many ideas. I mean, uh, what to do with the coatings? We have a lot of coated problem products, and these things end up contaminating slag and contaminating uh, scrap. Sorry. And also copper, and so also the, there's a real challenge on this revolution area. And I, for this reason, I invite you for uh, next week, I think, yeah, February 15th. Uh, Professor Dirk Habe, which I guess everybody knows by name at least, who is a, a, a I think a locomotive is not uh, enough. Uh, he is a heavy badesha in Germany. He does everything. He he produces high quality work. And uh, they are doing green steel research at Max Planck in Dusseldorf. And uh, interesting enough, I have a, uh, we have a Brazilian doctor, it's now Souza Filho, who is working on hydrogen production of steel. And they are going to give a talk with the help of Facelor Mittal. And this is going to be in their YouTube channel. So if you are interested, I think uh, Fabio has the link and he can circulate for whoever is interested. And the link is also in LinkedIn in my account. So. Uh, this is all I wanted to say at this point. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for your interest, Fabio. And I'll just give you the screen back so that you don't take think I'm. So thank you so you. much, uh, Andre, uh, for your interesting and nice talk as usual. Uh, and just focusing just for the for the second to the last point. So if you allow me, then we will. I will send you to participants to this meeting. So, uh, if it is open to the public, I think it is very interesting to hear people from Brazil because you have some inventivity that is something unique, and also from Germany as well. So, so if uh, if we will share with the participants, it will be fine. No, uh, ArcelorMittal has a YouTube channel. And so the way they are going to do it, they are going to do it in the YouTube channel live, and they are, and then we will be moderating the questions uh, mm -hmm. through uh, Zoom. So it's going to be, I think it's going to work very well. They do it frequently, so I think it's okay. Going to be nice. Okay, very interesting. So now everybody, if uh, first of all we will just have time for one or two questions because I want to be on time for the lesson on Professor Badesha, but we can even contact Andre if you would like. A couple of questions from anyone that's been listening or you want to switch uh, to the lecture as for, as for you. As for me, it was really interesting, but I have comments to do uh, later on. Uh, uh, Christophe Stocky, bonjour, yes. comment ça va? Yes, bonjour. please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just one question regarding the low density steel. Uh, did, you, uh, did you check the footprint of uh, the use of aluminium and manganese? Yes, no, I did not. Yeah, the quest. This is a, a fantastic question because it's, it's very much like. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, it's like uh, when people make aluminum cars. Uh, if you go and make aluminum as an alloy, 10% alloying addition, it's not only a tremendous footprint as you as you're mentioning, but it's also a horrible problem of recycling because yeah. uh, when you when you recycle 10% aluminum scrap, it's going to be. 10% aluminum becoming 20% uh, slag because it's going to turn into alumina. You're not recycling it. So, mm -hmm. so it's a very nice idea, very interesting. And uh, I think it's, it's fantastic, the idea of having a low density steel. But uh, I'm very careful, as you said. I mean, I, I think your point is fantastic because it's, uh, there's some stuff. I mean, most stuff that you put in steel has a larger footprint than iron. So that's that's a huge problem. So I think the way is micro alloying, but uh, 
I think uh, other things, I mean, if, if we close our minds to other opportunities, we may run into trouble, but I think you're absolutely correct. I did not check, but it cannot be a light footprint. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.